can ask one favour? Um, where it's safe to do so, be mindful of the seats, giving it all of that. Can everyone just stand up for me? Because I heard somewhere, and it might have been in that message from Leeds, that sitting is the new smoking and sedentary behaviour. And we're here in a room full of health professionals, and you've all been sat on your buttocks for, for quite a while. Give yourself a bit of a shake without knocking anybody out. Right, up. OK, thank you. So I, I think I've got the worst slot because I'm in the runaway slot now, aren't I? Uh, so I'm going to try uh, and make sure that you, you catch your trains, although I can't promise getting you up to Glasgow. Right, so um, does anywhere know where Medway is? And no, it is not a place in the South Pacific. <laughs> if we go back to the uh, Second World War. Madam? We're from Maidstone. Give me a break. Oh, OK, all right, all right. So you've heard that introduction. So Medway, is, it's a very interesting place uh, and quite dynamic. And I spoke to somebody earlier on and, and they didn't actually know where it was. So hopefully after today, you will put Medway on the map. Mm, picture, 12th century Norman keep, one of the best preserved in the country. And next to it, the second oldest cathedral in England, Rochester Cathedral. Heard of Mr. Dickens with these tales of how many things? All right, I won't go into the Dickens bit, but Rochester have a sweets festival every year and there's lots of stuff that happens in and around there. Um, Chatham Dockyard, anyone know anything about the Battle of Trafalgar? Anyone from Portsmouth here? <laughs> Not admitting to it. All right, HMS Victory, Chatham Dockyard, historical heritage, the Dutch, we celebrated the Dutch coming up there and 300 years ago and breaking the boom and then nicking our flagship and dragging it off the place. So Chatham, very strong naval history, built HMS Victory. Uh, and that is the old town hall that used to be, I think it was built in 1900, Chatham Town Hall. It's now a theatre, a Brook Theatre. So actually Medway is a very cultured place, but it's also got fantastic ambitions. Much of the population, 280 odd thousand. It's going to grow by 50,000 in the next sort of, I would say about five to 10 years. And the reason why it's growing, because it was in the Telegraph this week, so it must be true, is that we are the hidden gem of the South East. <laughs> 34 minutes commuting distance from Chatham, high speed one from uh, Chatham up to, to London. And people recognise that, property prices, etc. So what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that We've got affordable housing, but we've also got, as I mentioned before, a history of disadvantage. Um, anyone here get the data on cancer survival rates? Last week, they're out. Anyone know where, or would like to hazard a guess where Medway is ranked in terms of lung cancer one year survival rates? Low. Low. Couldn't be lowest, worst in the country. Yeah. That links into our historical heritage. They used to make and refurbish submarines because it was the naval base. The base shut down in 1983 and they do lots of other um, sort of, how can I put it? There's lots of other work in there that meant that people were exposed to those kind of carcinogenic factors that have then led into uh, our cancer rates. So our smoking prevalence is going down, but I'll come on to some of that. So we've got a place which is vibrant. We've got a place that's exploding in terms of population. We've got fantastic ambitions for the future. But like everyone else, you've got dramas. That's a naval sort of museum. And that's people running along, giving it the big one. <laughs> we have a thing called the Medway Mile. Okay. Um, everyone's talked about deprivation. I'm not going to say it anymore, because that's one of my challenges. But I would go back and reflect on what John said, because I've just done a piece of work around an equity audit. And 10% of my population that live in the most affluent areas, that gap between the 40%, so some of these folk uh, that are indicated on the map here, and that 40% has increased significantly. My life expectancy, I'll show you shortly, is going in the wrong direction in terms of inequity. And that is a serious issue for me. So, yada yada, so on and so forth. Red is bad, green is good. And as you can see, red is very bad. So looking at this, and, and we've talked earlier about what the role of local authorities might be to address 
the challenge about putting health into our policies. I, I'm going to take the P word out of this because I don't think it's about policies. I think it's about culture. Somebody mentioned earlier on, uh, and I think it was one of our registrars uh, was talking about, should we uh, have a national sort of legislative framework to tackle this? We don't actually need it. What we actually need is people who have got sharp elbows. Now, where does that come from? So Martin talked earlier on, and, uh, and Martin can, can talk, and he, and, and he resonates. So about five or six years ago, I was doing a bit of CPD um, up at some place, and Martin came along and talked to us all. There was a lot of consultants and public health directors. And he said, and he pointed his finger, and he said, I'm going to point at you, and I'm not being rude. You are arrogant because you believe in the evidence and the evidence is what makes people change their minds you've now moved into local authorities this was a transition period when we moved from the NHS into local authorities and he said it's a combat sport <laughs> he did he said you got to sharpen your elbows because unless you do you'll be assumed and you will not be able to make a difference and I want you to make a difference. If you heard him speak earlier on, he puts his money where his mouth is. He really does. Now, I'm blessed to have a similar type of character. He's not as, how can I say, as outward going as, as, as Martin is. But my, my chief executive is very definitely one of those people who wants people to change the system. So one of the things that public health does do, it brings money. Now, you know this thing about money it brings power and you know this thing about power what, what else does power bring i can't really see you guys at the back because the lights are in my face so i'm gonna have to look at this crew down here although i could come around but i'll lose the mic what what do we get from power influence okay so one thing that we've got depending on where you are and where you place is you've got a budget within the public health sort of arena but the other thing that you've got is legislation and as statutory appointees dphs in most cases, have got a voice and a seat around the top table. So a few years back, what we sort of sat down and thought was, how could we create a system that meant local authorities, and it isn't just the local authority, because that's why the thing around the joint health and wellbeing strategy, it's all of the partners, but local authorities are quite key within that. How can we actually do something that's place shaping? So we said, all right, we're going to have these things called collaborative working agreements. Now, what does that mean? Okay, yada yada, so on and so forth, influences on health, green, big influences and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into it because you've gone through this in quite deep detail. But suffice to say, all of the tools that are in your armoury are within either a lower tier or an upper tier local authority in combination to change the dynamics. And I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the stuff that we have done in our local area. Before I do that, what do you think out of that little rainbow is one of the most significant factors for us? Anyone? From the cheap seats, even the ones that are running away. Can't be that bad. Housing, okay. Work, all right. Education, education, education. Somebody said that once and I don't think he's in power anymore. Anyway. Um, and the problem that we have is shifting sands. So we've all got these things called academies, and academies are flexing their arms, aren't they? So sometimes local authorities lose their ability to influence and control that. Um, one of the issues that we talked about earlier on was that life course, and how do we support children? And we've held old stats on moving forward in the life course, so it has to be through education. So we created this process where we said, right, do you know what? You will deliver these outcomes that are linked into a high-level strategy. So we've got a health wellbeing strategy. And what I will do is I will maybe work with you to improve your outcomes. And because we've got this thing called austerity, we will use some of my resource, which is not my resource, it's the council's resource, to deliver outcomes for that population group. So we created this mechanism by which people started to then come on board. Now... I sit at the top table and whatever the top table is, so I'm going to take that back. I sit in this corporate management team, so I'm quite 
able to talk to my peers and uh, influence them where I can. But remember, Martin talked about sharp elbows. All right. So anyone that knows anything about local authority means that <laughs> it's the size of your budget that means that you get your thing through there. And unless you're actually able to demonstrate that, then people often will say, go and speak to so-and-so. So we changed that dynamic. Um, through strategic leadership with our CEO, he said, right, actually, you're all going to work together, and James, you're going to lead on making sure that we do. Just watch this, if it works. The schools are being encouraged to sign up to help monitor air pollution levels at the school gates next academic year. Supporting the initiative will earn those involved the chance to earn recognition at the county's annual Green School Awards, thanks to a new category championed by Medway Council. We're excited to have this new category within the Green School Awards. I mean, for me as Director of Public Health, it's one of the things that we're really focused on, giving people insight into what they can do and what everyone can do across Medway to improve the quality of life, air quality, it's one of the major problems across society, nationally, but within Medway, we know what we're trying to do, which is to protect and improve the quality of life for our children of the future, and we're starting here. Medway Council have been monitoring air quality for a number of years now. It's something that we really engage with and proactive with doing. We would really like to get communities and particularly schools involved with this and do some monitoring themselves, see what's going on in their local environment, around their schools, what differences they're seeing, why this might be the case, get them involved with our monitoring programme. One of the monitoring forms that we do, really easy to do, small tubes, you can put that up anywhere, there's a lamp post, a sign post, a drain pipe, really low cost, really easy to put up and down each month. And what we'd like is children to really get energised with this, do the monitoring, look at the results. To find out more, please visit kmwaterschools.co.uk. OK, so, am I on? I think I am. So, one of the things that you've got to do is practical stuff. Remember Martin said, make it real. So you've got to make it real, so that's a real thing. One of our challenges in Medway is air quality. We're surrounded by the M25, the A2, the M20. Our proximity to the continent means that we get southwesterly wind and lots of stuff comes right over and we can't get rid of it. And we're actually one of the monitoring stations for the UK, so we can, we've got these devices, and that's Stuart Seed, he's a really nice guy who sits in our environmental health team. But I fund and I deliver some of those programmes. Why? Because we've got something like 90, I know something, 98 schools in Medway. The number of vehicle movements to and from them each day uh, we have 125 deaths related to air, poor air quality. In the so not only am I actually trying to improve the outcomes for the children, I'm trying to look at the infrastructure. Because if the infrastructure, fewer people are in the cars at peak times, i.e. 9 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock, then the delivery vehicles and everyone else that needs to get thrown around the town gets around. So we channel shift it. And that's a win-win for our director of um, transport and regeneration. Getting people outside and active. One of our collaborative working agreements is with, and somebody mentioned earlier on, I think it was our regeneration team. Okay, I'll come on to that. Um, is saying, all right then, tourism's a big thing for us because we all want you to come down, come down and have a look at our, northern, uh, our, our Norman Keep. Um, but our physical activity rates were pants, literally. People were not going out and using those fantastic spaces that we got, why? Fear of crime, fear of not being able to get down there because the route was overgrown, fear of nobody to walk with them. And actually, so we said, all right, how can we actually do this? Linking with our voluntary sector colleagues, linking in with our people. We've got a, a, our own in-house organisation called Medway Sport, but also my team. We said, all right, let's get people more active. How can we actually facilitate that? So we've now got over a thousand health walks and people are using them. Great getting outdoors and exploring the Medway countryside. Well, we've been walking now together for three years. Great bunch of people, good social uh, get together on a Tuesday, so uh, there you go. I really enjoy it. Yeah, super. We certainly don't get this sitting at home. 
from here, you can see the castle, the cathedral, uh, just a brilliant view. And from onwards up, it's all countryside. Each walk's between 45, 75 minutes, aimed at all sorts of ages, young and old, and um, it helps people keep fit. So one of the, the other challenges then is, is about not just translating that health walk into wider policy. It's about influencing it. So everyone heard of the uh, a local plan. So local plan's the thing that you use for place shaping, whether it's housing, residential, commercial, all that type of stuff. Developers have got to pay contributions into the local authority um, for to offset any kind of impact that that development might, might have in its 106 funding. Working with our planning department, uh, we've been able to secure Section 106 funding to develop green spaces, to do things, not, and it isn't just about outside, we can use it for revenue to fund different elements of our service provision. Why are we able to do that? Because actually, we recognise, or our planning team recognise, that we're supportive of that, and I've got people in there. Um, anyone drink alcohol here? Sometimes the same. All right. So in Medway, uh, as you might expect from an old seaside, well, seafaring town, um, we ha used to have lots of pubs and lots of trouble with folk who like to give it lots of that and then fall over in the street. So in last year, yeah, May 2018, we established cumulative uh, impact zone for alcohol. And that meant that anyone that was putting forward a development that would involve either dishing out alcohol, so that's offline since, or if it was a restaurant that was opening with the pub, their application was scrutinised by a planning committee. We put in a public health sort of appendix to that to refuse applications if they, we decided that there were already too many off-licenses in there. And in addition to that, not just the volume of alcohol, but the type of alcohol pie volume that was served. Up to date, we've refused, I think, nine applications, and I got rid of another one yesterday. Uh, we've had 30 in that period. Nine of those um, applications as well, we modified, and three people sort of withdrew their plans. Again, through working with our planning team. Talked about smoking, major preventable cause of. Um, we work with our regulatory services teams. Again, inserting health in all policies. Everyone know about smoke-free stuff. We've got smoke-free hospitals, that type of things. Our regulatory services team go up, they monitor, they support our hospitals. We used to have, well, you can see it on the stand there, 25% our highest prevalence, and it's going that way. One of the other reasons why it's going that way is because we've got a shop on our high street in one of our major sort of regeneration areas. How do we do that? Because I spoke to our housing teams and we said, we want one of your shops, thanks very much, because the council owned a few of those so we could rent them out. And they refurbished it. So we've now got an open access health shop, we'll call it that, but it does more than just help stop people smoking, um, right on prime real estate in the middle of one of our busiest thoroughfares, which is right next to our bus station and in one of our more disadvantaged communities. Mental health. Adult education, we influence those. Building community resilience, helping people with the skills that they need. John mentioned the, you know, whether people are activated and they have the currency to actually take up on the offer. We work with uh, our adult health team to do that. We've got four universities in Medway, a technical college and a further ed site. And with those environments and with those colleges, we work with them. And that, again, is through our sort of skills-based work to ensure that they deliver things for our population. Finally, if there is a final, because I'm definitely missing the training right, because I'm nearly, I'm nearly done, don't worry. Um, we talk about the place, but the place is nothing without people. So every single development that goes through our planning team comes to me, and it comes, and I'm not saying it comes to me, but it comes to me because that's how it happens now. It's integrated into the process. I'm able to scrutinise that via my team, and I've got a lovely uh, colleague, Sue Orms, who's fantastic. She actually puts her foot down 
and, uh, and determines whether things are going to pass or not pass or what modification they have. So here you see, you probably heard the news, didn't you? There was, I can't even remember which London borough it was, where there was a gated community developers putting a plan, didn't they? And they wouldn't let the kids from the estate go onto the parks. So this is a, a major development. We're going to build a significant number of homes. In there, you can see it's all being planned through. So there are open green spaces for people to just enjoy the space. The density of the, the housing is meant to be sufficient so that people can actually move outside. Green charging points and all the rest that, that, that they need to have. But ultimately, we have planned in people rather than buildings. So the answer is this. There isn't one particular answer. What you have to have is political buying. We've been working with some of our boroughs as well, so lower tier districts, and, and I think one of our colleagues might be in the audience from Maidstone, and they've been able to develop, oh, there he is, well done. So they've been able to develop a CDWA policy uh, within that, and they're not an upper tier, but they are a district. They've got housing responsibilities, they've got planning responsibilities, they've been able to embed some of that CDWA work into their strategic plans. It can be done. They're working with their libraries, I think, and the other element was education? Leisure, Leisure that's right. So it can be done. You don't need additional legislation. What you need to have is a sharp elbows, a keen sense of a win-win, because the only way in which you will get health in all policies if you understand the culture of the place, if you're able to speak the language, if you don't point your finger as public health professionals and say you've got to do it like that, because people just get turned off and say we're not going to do it at all, and influencing. So all of the work that I've talked about, I've now ended up, unfortunately for me, being responsible for commissioning of partnership services for children and adult social care. Why is that important? I've grabbed it because it's about the life course. And that enables me to, again, shape more of that system to actually control, and I'll use that word, some of the policies and programmes that come out of our system so that they actually make the difference for my population. So thanks very much for your time.